How's it going, YouTube? Brothers and sisters in Christ, I love you. Um, I'm going to do another video today. Uh, but before I uh, do this, um, i got to share some things that uh, the Lord has told me. There are four judgments coming to America. Four. One has already passed, and that was the hurricanes and the fires. Um, these natural disasters are not going to get any better. They're just going to keep getting perpetually worse. Um, the wickedness of this nation is great, and it has reached unto heaven, and he is not happy with it or with our country. And people need to wake up now. I'm a watchman, and I see if I see the sword coming upon the land, and I say nothing, the blood is on my own head. But if I am warning others that the sword is coming upon the land, and judgment is coming to this nation, and y'all don't take it seriously, that's not my problem, man. I, we, you, you have been duly warned. And again, I'll say this. I am not a man pleaser. I love the Lord Jesus Christ. We are here for him and his purpose. Uh, I am also a dad. I have three children, and that's the other reason I am here. I'm here for no other purpose. So uh, we had a major, well, I'm not going to say a major earthquake, but there was an earthquake in, in uh, Ferndale, California today. But the reason I'm bringing this up is because there was two of them. And uh, they were on the edge of the Cascadia subduction zone. Now, if you live in the Pacific Northwest for especially as long as me, which is all my life, you know that ever since I was a child, I was told that there's going to be a major earthquake. 8.5 or higher um, in the Pacific Northwest. Uh, I'm going to read to you about the Cascadia subduction zone here real quick. Okay, the Cascadia subduction zone, and this is on the USGS. Two contrasting models of lithospheric structure. The subduction zone of the Juan de Fuca plate beneath, the, beneath North America changes markedly along the length of the subduction zone, notably in the angle of subduction. Distribution of the earthquake, volcanism, geologic and seismic structure of the upper plate, and regional horizon horizontal stress. To investigate these characteristics, we conducted detailed density modeling experiments of the crust and mantle along two transects across the Cascadia subduction zone. And uh, I might add that the Cascadia subduction zone is one of the most studied subduction zones in the world. It runs from the tip of Northern California all the way up to British Columbia. And this, this is not a fault mine. This is a subduction zone. This produces mega thrust earthquakes capable of producing over an 8.5 in magnitude. Okay, and then they, okay, they say, we conducted detailed density modeling experiments of the crust and mantle along two transects across the Cascadia subduction zone. One crosses Vancouver Island and the Canadian mar margin, and the other crosses the margin of Central Oregon. Both density models were constructed independently to a depth of approximately 50 kilometers. We gathered all possible geological, geologic, geophysical, and borehole data to constrain the density of calculations. The final densities for the Oregon and Vancouver lithosphere models were obtained from gravity inversion. They don't really know anything about it. They've even said that they can't even pr predict a major earthquake. But I've been re I've been reading about the subduction zone and. Uh, it's not something to be taken lightly, especially when uh, 
I really feel like the Lord told me that we're going to have a major earthquake pretty soon here in the Pacific Northwest. Um, there's not much time to repent. He also told me that we had 40 days to repent from August 21st. Solar request. And the last day, again, I will say this again, falls on the Day of Atonement on September 30th. That cannot be coincidence. Now, there's also people saying that there's the sign that's coming in the sky that's only seen every 7,000 years or so. But uh, th that's just because they don't understand the book of Revelations. Uh, the book of Revelations, chapter 12, states, I'll just go there real quick. But before I do so, oh, uh, I'm going to go to a couple places. But before I do that, I just want to pray to our Father for wisdom and guidance, like we should do each and every time we read his word. Glorious Heavenly Father, who are in heaven, righteous and just, we come to you in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, Father, and we just ask that you open up our minds and open up our hearts to receive the truth from your most precious word. And we ask that you just protect all of our brothers and sisters in Christ and lead the lost to repentance. We ask all these things, nothing wavering, faithfully, in the name of our precious Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, Yeshua HaMashiach, Amen. All right, we're going to go to the book of Revelations real quick to read about this sign that's supposedly in the sky in Revelation 12. Revelation 12, and this is the woman and the dragon. So Revelation 12, and chapter, I mean verse 1. And there appeared a great wonder in heaven. A wonder is like a sign in heaven. The woman clothed with the sun, and the moon under her feet, and upon her head a crown of twelve stars. Well, here's the thing. Um, I'm not, I don't think this is, and I'm, I could be wrong. I don't think this is a literal sign in the sky. Um, I think it's specifically talking about the church and the 12 tribes of Israel because uh, who is Mother Israel? The woman's always symbolic of the church. Usually. And these 12 stars I feel are really representing the 12, 12 tribes of Israel because it goes on to state in verse 2 and she being with child cried travailing in birth and pain to be delivered and here's the thing verse 3 and there appeared another wonder in heaven and behold a great red dragon having seven heads and ten horns and a set a and seven crowns upon his head now, the dragon is Satan himself. I mean, if, if you've been studying our Father's Word any length of time, you should know that the dragon is Satan. Seven heads is the seven continents. Ten horns are going to be the ten coming kings. The ten coming kings who, as of not yet, have not received their kingdom, but will receive their kingdom once Satan, the Antichrist, uh, shows up upon the earth. I don't know exactly how that's going to happen. Uh, my guess is he's going to try to act like the second coming of Jesus Christ. Verse 4. And his tail drew the third part of the stars of heaven and did cast them to the earth. Okay, now stars are often symbolic of angels, like the fallen angels, the, the one-third that he took with him when he rebelled against God, trying to covet his mercy seat. 
And the dragon stood before the woman, who? The woman, the church, which was ready to be delivered for to devour her child as soon as it was born. Now, if you go to Matthew, what was going on in Matthew when Jesus was being born? They were seeking his life from the very beginning to kill him. This is talking about Jesus Christ. Verse 5. And she brought forth a man-child who was to rule all nations with a rod of iron. And her child was caught up unto God and to his throne. And that would ha would, that happened when he was crucified for our sins on the cross and was risen on the third day and set at the right hand of God. Verse 6. And the woman fled into the wilderness where she hath a place prepared of God that they should feed her there a thousand and okay a thousand two hundred and three score days so 1260 days which i don't think this has actually happened yet but i could be wrong i'm just a man speaking of the lord verse seven and there was war in heaven where in heaven michael and his angels fought against the dragon and the dra dragon fought in his angels and prevailed not this means that satan and the fallen angels are warring with michael and the other archangels verse 8 and prevailed not neither was their place found any more in heaven why because he was sitting there day and night accusing us to god accusing the brethren accusing the saints day and night did he do this when we literally really have done nothing wrong. We have, we have accepted Christ as our Savior. We are no longer under the judgment of sin because God does not see us. He sees Christ. So therefore, when we sin, we have an intercessor, which is Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, who intercesses to the Father for the remission of sins. And hear this. Verse 9. And the great dragon was cast out. That old serpent. What old serpent? The, the old serpent from the book of Genesis. In the Garden of Eden. Called the devil and Satan. There's two of his names right there. And he has a third name too, the dragon. Which deceiveth the whole world. He was cast out into the earth. And his angels were cast out with him. The fallen angels. The ones that people claim are these aliens, which are not really aliens. They're just fallen angels. Verse 10. And I heard a loud voice saying, In heaven. Where? In heaven. Now is come salvation and strength and the kingdom of our God. And the power of his Christ. For the accuser, who? The accuser which is Satan, of our brethren, is cast down, which accused them before our God day and night. That is why he is cast out, because God has had enough of it, and he kicks him out. Most people think that Satan has already been kicked out of heaven. No, he has not. He has not been kicked out. His spirit roams the earth, just like Christ's spirit, the Holy Spirit, roams the earth. But he will be kicked out of heaven, and he will show up here, and he will act like he is Christ's return to rapture the church and say that he is whatever other God that you might believe in. Verse 11. And they, who? They, which are the saints, overcame him by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony, and they loved not their lives unto the death. Meaning they put away their lives for Christ's sake which we have done. Verse 12. Therefore rejoice ye heavens, and ye that dwell in them. Woe to the inhabitants of the earth, and to the sea, for the devil is come down unto you, having great wrath, because he knoweth that he hath but a short time, because he knows that Christ's coming is right after that. 
not far afterwards. He knows this. Verse 13. And when the dragon saw that he was cast under the earth, he persecuted the woman, which is the church, which brought forth the man-child. Where did Christ come from? He came from the seed of David. Ever since the beginning, the beginning of this earth age, there has been two seed lines. One was the seed line which the serpent created. I'm not going to go into a lot of detail here on that. But you might want to go read the book of Genesis, specifically chapter 3 again. Because they did not eat an apple. If you think they ate an apple, you're out of your mind. God would not impose a sentence that is sexual if they ate an apple. You get what I'm saying? There were two seed lines from the beginning. One was the seed line of Cain, which was the seed line of Satan. Two, the second one, was the seed line of Adam, the pure seed line that would bring forth Christ, undefiled because the seed line could not be perverted, and they tried to pervert it many times. Satan's first attempt was in the Garden of Eden. The second time was when the fallen angels came in the, in the book of Genesis chapter 6 and mated with earth women and bore the giants. The churches ain't teaching this. The, the, the mainstream church is not going to teach you that. You're not going to hear that there. Because they're wolves in sheep's clothing. I'm not saying that they're all bad. And I'm not judging no man. Our father will do that. But I am saying what mine eyes have seen. What are your eyes seeing? Ask yourself that question. I'm going to go... To the book of Isaiah because I cannot stress the coming judgment enough I cannot stress this enough if you have not repented please do so please we do not have the time to be lollygagging around and uh, doing whatever we please I think the old man has done enough of that don't you why don't we live for Christ, for our Savior, live for Him, put our lives to Him. Put your trust in Christ, not man. This world's going to pass away. Well, I'm going to say this age. And we're going to go to the book, I, book of Isaiah, and we're going to go to chapter 1, and then Isaiah chapter 24, and then we're going to be the only ones that I'm going to read. And I cannot stress that I, I don't want anyone being deceived because I love all of you. I love everyone. And I don't think people are going to really get this until it's too late. But we tried. We tried. Isaiah chapter 1, I'll give you a minute to get there. All right, Isaiah chapter 1 and verse 1, and it reads, The vision of Isaiah, the son of Amos, which he saw concerning Judah and Jerusalem in the days of Uzziah, Jotham, Ahaz, and Hezekiah, kings of Judah. The wickedness of Judah. Verse 2. Hear, O heavens, and give ear, O earth, for the Lord hath spoken. I have nourished and brought up children, and they have rebelled against me. Verse 3. Now, I'm just going to pause right there. Right here it says, I have nourished and brought forth children. Our Father has been clothing us all these years and feeding us all these years. 
and people want to just dismiss him like he's some fairy tale and he don't exist. Well, he has feelings too. Our little feelings are just a mere resemblance of what he has. And I don't think people get that. I have children, you know? I do. God gave me children. Three of them. Beautiful children. And a beautiful wife. And you know what? If my children did that to me, rebelled against me, how would you feel? And, and, and then to, to drive, drive the point more, he sends his only begotten son, which is him, incarnate in the flesh, and died for our sins. Our sins, not his, ours. Because he loves us. Verse 3, the ox knoweth his owner, and the ass his master's crib. But Israel doth not know, my people doth not consider. In other words, he's saying, this dumb animal knows who his owner is, but my children don't know who I am. Verse 4, ah, sinful nation, a people laden with iniquity, a seed of evildoers, children that are corruptors, they have forsaken the Lord, they have provoked the Holy One of Israel unto anger. They are gone away backward, like a backsliding heifer, I might add. Verse 5. Why should ye be stricken any more? Ye will revolt more and more. The whole head is sick, and the whole heart faints. In other words, it's, been, it's, it's so seared with calluses that, that, that the conscience can't even have a clean conscience. Verse 6. From the sole of the foot, even unto the head, there is no soundness in it. Not but wounds, and bruises, and putrefying sores. They have not been clothed, clothed neither bound up, neither mollified with ointment. In other words, he's saying, they're not even trying to fix it. Verse 7. He says, your country is desolate. Your cities are burned with fire. Your land strangers devour in the presence, in your presence. And it is desolate as overthrown by strangers. Now what's going on in our country? You got a whole bunch of illegal immigrants showing up over here that are not even legally supposed to be here. I have no problem with foreigners coming here. And I am not a racist man. But when they're illegally coming here and taking our hard-earned tax dollars because they're sitting there, uh, I'm entitled to this, I'm entitled to that, so they can pander votes. Yeah, you're dang straight, I got a pro problem with that one. All right, where was I? Okay. Verse 7. Oh, no. Yeah. Verse 8. And the daughter of Zion is left as a cottage in a vineyard, as a lodge in a garden of cucumbers, as a besieged city. Verse 9. Except the Lord of hosts had left unto us a very small remnant, and I can't stress that enough, there's a very small remnant, we should have been as Sodom, and we should have been like unto Gomorrah. Now what was Sodom and Gomorrah doing? Well, I'll tell you this, this generation's worse than Sodom and Gomorrah. You got, you got the, the aborted babies by the thousands. You got these people in the streets prancing around like little school girls with their little rainbow flags. A little rainbow flags. Dude, that's disgusting, man. We don't want to see that. We don't want to see guys on guys and girls on girls. It's filthy. It's disgusting. Oh, and then we got the transgenders. Don't even get me started on that. People who were born a man and now they think they're a chick. You, yeah, you gotta be kidding me, man. And, and people just walk, walk around like there's nothing wrong with it. Yes, there is something wrong with it. And don't even get me started on how these little whores are dressing like whores. We don't want to see that neither.
This is why we're hated of all men's sake, for Christ's sake. It's because we speak the word of God. We say what God said, not what we said, what God said, what our fathers had said was sinful and disgusting and an abomination unto him. And then we're hated for it, persecuted. Verse 10, hear the word of the Lord, ye rulers of Sodom. I'm talking to you, government. Give ear unto the law of our God, ye people of Gomorrah. Other governments around the world, you better heed this warning too, because it's for y'all. Verse 11, to what purpose is the multitude of your sacrifice unto me, saith the Lord? I am full of the burnt offerings of rams and the fat of fed beasts, and I delight not in the blood of bullocks or of lambs or of he goats. He wants our undivided love. He wants us to come to him in love. Verse 12, when ye come to appear before me, who hath requited this at your hand to tread my courts, saith the Lord? Verse 13, bring no more vain oblations. Incense is an abomination unto me. The new moons and Sabbaths, the calling of assemblies, I cannot away with it. It is iniquity, even the solemn meeting. In other words, he's saying even your feasts are iniquity to me. Your holidays, they're a bunch of iniquity. Ishtar, which is supposed to be, to be Passover. But it's, it's not. They, they, just because uh, one word in the Bible says Easter, which if you actually look at that in the Greek, it says Pascha, which is Passover. Our Passover. You know, the blood of the Lamb, which was slain on the cross for our sins, that Passover. And this is what he says. 14. Your new moons and your appointed feasts, my soul hateth. They are a trouble unto me. I am weary to bear them. He hates them. Verse 15. And when ye spread forth your hands, I will hide mine eyes from you. Yeah, when you ye, yeah, when ye make many prayers, I will not hear. Your hands are full of blood. In other words, he's saying you're a bunch of murderers. I'm not specifically pointing my finger at anybody. I'm just saying. Verse 16. Wash you. Make you clean. Put away the evil of your doings from before mine eyes. Cease to do evil. Verse 17. Learn to do well. Seek judgment. Relieve the oppressed. Judge the fatherless and plead for the widow. In other words, those who have lost their, let's say their dad went overseas and uh, was killed. And he has a wife over here who has like five children. You know, uh, we're supposed to be comforting them people. Not putting more burdens on their shoulders like they like to do. Verse 18, come now and let us reason together, saith the Lord. Though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Though they be red like crimson, they shall be as wool. Why? Because we're washed in the blood of the Lamb, which is Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Verse 19, if ye be willing and obedient, ye shall, not, ye shall eat the good of the land. Verse 20, but if ye refuse and rebel, ye shall be devoured with the sword, for the mouth of the Lord hath spoken. He hath spoken it, and he will not change his mind. Verse 21, how is the faithful city become an harlot? It was full of judgment, righteousness lodged in it, but now murderers. And I'll just say this. Don't account, it, don't account this no strange thing that the sons of Cain made it past the flood. They're called the Kenites. I'm going to do a later study on that later on, but they made it past it. You can see that just by going to Matthew 23 and reading a couple words in the Greek.
verse 22. Thy silver is become dross, thy wine mixed with water. In other words, the truth that has become so watered down with flyaway doctrines. And uh, uh, it, oh, it's okay to be a, I'm not going to say that, to be gay. Oh, it's okay to think you're a woman. It's okay to abort your baby. No, it's not. It never was. Verse 23, thy princess, the princes are rebellious and companions of thieves. Everyone loveth gifts and follow after reward. They judge not the fatherless, neither doth the cost of the widow come unto them. In other words, they're just patting each other's back, bribe after bribe after bribe, giving each other money so they look the other way. While they pile burden upon burden on our shoulders. Verse 24, therefore saith the Lord, the Lord of hosts, the mighty one of Israel. It's saying all those names right there so you can understand. Ah, I will ease me of mine adversaries and avenge me of mine enemies. Verse 25, and I will turn mine hand upon thee and purely purge away thy dross and take away all thy tin. In other words, all that swag, you know, like if you ever seen gold refined in the fire, uh, there, there, there's the, the slag that comes off of it until it's a pure piece of gold. That's what he's saying. He's saying that he's going to refine you in the fire until you're pure. Verse 27. No, verse 26. And I will restore thy judges as at, as at the first, and thy counselors as at the beginning. Afterward, thou shalt be called the city of righteousness, the faithful city. Verse 27. Zion shall be redeemed with judgment, and her, her converts with righteousness. Verse 28, and the destruction of the transgressors and of the sinners shall be together, and they that forsake the Lord shall be consumed. Verse 29, for they shall be ashamed of the oaks which, they, which ye have desired, and ye shall be confounded for the gardens that ye have chosen. Verse 30, for ye shall be as an oak whose leaf fadeth, and as a garden that hath no water. Verse 31, and the strong shall be as a toe, and the make, and the maker of it as a spark, and they shall both burn together, and none shall quench it. I'm going to go to verse chapter 24 real quick in this book of Isaiah. Okay, Isaiah chapter 24. And this is what's coming after. Isaiah chapter 24 and verse 1, and it reads, Behold, the Lord maketh the earth empty, and maketh it waste, and turneth it upside down, and scattereth the broad the inhabitants thereof. Now before I go any further, I should say this. People are thinking that there's going to be a rapture on September 23rd, and it's the end of the world and all this. And on, I'll see you on September 24th. Verse 2. And it shall be as with the people, so with the priest, as with the servant, so with his master, as with the maid, so with her mistress, as with fire, so with the seller, as with the lender, so with the borrower, as with the taker of usury, so with the giver of the usury to him. In other words, everybody's going to be created equal. God is not a respecter of persons. Verse 3. The land shall be utterly emptied and utterly spoiled, for the Lord hath spoken it. No, for the Lord hath spoken this word. Verse 4. The earth mourneth and fadeth away. The world languisheth and fadeth away. The haughty people of the earth do languish. In other words, the, the, the ones with their noses so stuck up in the clouds that, that uh, they're better than everybody and, and, and yeah. Okay, anyways. Verse 5. The earth also is defiled under the inhabitants thereof, because they have transgressed the laws. 
changed the ordinance, broken the everlasting covenant. Now this one, it says, change the ordinance and all that. I specifically think that this is speaking when the Antichrist shows up, claiming to be Jesus Christ. But the transgression of the law, that's already been done. And I might, I might want to add this too. Uh, we're not going to be perfect in these bodies. We're not going to be, we're still going to sin. But we have an intercessor. Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, for the remission of sins, who pleads to the Father when we do. Okay, verse 6. Therefore hath the curse devoured the earth, and they that dwell in there are desolate. Therefore the inhabitants of the earth are burned, and few men left. Verse 7, the new wine mourneth, the vine languisheth, all the merry hearted do sigh. In other words, them people who are out partying all the time. Verse 8, I know because I used to be one of them. I know how it is. Verse 8, the mirth of the tabret ceaseth, the noise of them that rejoice endeth, the joy of the harp ceaseth. Verse 9, they shall not put drink, they shall not drink wine with a song, strong drink shall be bitter. To them that drink it. Verse 10. The city of confusion, which confusion is Babylon, is broken down. Every house is shut up, that no man may come in. Verse 11. There is a crying for wine in the streets. You know, Amos chapter 8. You know, the, the famine of the end times is not for bread, but for hearing the word of the Lord. Amos chapter 8. That's what this is speaking of. They're crying. The wine is, is the truth. Symbolic of the truth. There is a crying for wine in the streets. All joy is darkened. The mirth of the land is gone. In other words, it's, it is not a good day, is what it's saying. Verse 12. And the city is left desolation, and the gate is smitten with destruction. Verse 13. When thus it shall be in the midst of the land among the people, there shall be a shaking of an olive tree, and as the gleaning grapes, when the vintage is done. That don't sound good. That does not sound good. Verse 14. They shall lift up their voice. They shall sing for the majesty of the Lord. They shall cry aloud from the sea. Verse 15. 15 Wherefore glorify ye the Lord of, in the fires, even the name of the Lord God of Israel in the isles of the sea. Verse 16. From the uttermost part of the earth we have heard song, even glory to the righteous. But I said, my leanness, my leanness, woe, or warning unto me. The treacherous dealers have dealt treacherously. Yeah, the treacherous dealers have dealt very treacherously. And that is so applicable today. You know who these treacherous dealers are? They're specifically speaking of our leaders. Verse 17. Fear and the pit and the snare are upon the O earth, O inhabitants of the earth. In other words, it's saying right here, the pit, the snare, they're all traps. The trap is on the earth. What is the trap? It's the coming of the Antichrist. It's coming. He is coming. I, I get people saying, well, well, that just don't make no dang sense. Well, yes, it does, if you actually understand our Father's word. Yes, it does make a lot of sense. You can't understand the, begin the ending if you don't understand what happened in the beginning. And if a lot of people don't know what actually happened in the beginning, how are you going to even understand the middle or the end? And this, this, exact, this says exactly uh, what John said. John said that uh, those who shall die by the sword shall die by the sword. Those he leadeth into captivity, he leadeth them into captivity. Those who have ears to hear, let him hear. I'm paraphrasing. I can't even remember where it was. I know it's in there. What it's saying is, don't run. Like King Zedekiah, when he ran from King Nebuchadnezzar, and his children were slayed right in front of him, and his eyes were plucked out, and all his metal servants.
And this is how I know. Verse 18. And it shall come to pass that he who fleeth from the noise of the fear shall fall into the pit. And he that cometh up out of the midst of the pit, in other words, they're running for their lives, they're scared, shall be taken in the snare. The deception, the trap. For the windows on from on high are open, and the foundations of the earth do shake. That's why he said the cowardly will never enter the kingdom of heaven. Verse 19. The earth is utterly broken down. The earth is clean, dissolved. The earth is moved exceedingly. The earth shall reel to and fro like a drunkard, and shall be removed like a cotter. And the transgression shall the, the transgression thereof shall be heavy upon it, and it shall fall and not rise again. Verse 21. And it shall come to pass in that day that the Lord shall punish the hosts of the high ones that are on high. It says that for a reason, because that's talking about the fallen angels and Satan. And then it says, and the kings of the earth upon the earth. Them are the world leaders who know better. Verse 22. And they shall be to be gathered together as prisoners are gathered in the pit. And shall be shut up in the prison, and after many days shall they be visited. That's talking about after the Lord's day. They shall be visited when they're being thrown in the lake of fire. Verse 23. The moon shall be confounded, and the sun ashamed, when the Lord of hosts shall reign in Mount Zion, and in Jerusalem, and before his ancients gloriously. And amen to that. And I can't wait till that day. I don't know about y'all, but I'm ready to get the heck out of here. I don't care if I have to get my head whacked off, freaking, uh, I don't know, shot in it. I don't care. Whatever. Sorry if, uh, sometimes I, I'm not good at speech. I'm not good at talking. I, I've been a pretty shy, shy person my whole life, uh, I'm not really good with my speech, and I'm sorry if I come off as a butthole or a butthead, whatever. And I'm sorry for that. I just cannot stress this enough. The judgment is coming upon this nation. And people don't have that much longer to repent. I love you all. And may Jesus Christ be with you all, and God bless you.